Sunday in Lent, and we continue our message series, Holy Vessels. Our focus today is safekeeping, concerned with economic health and stability of our community. Vessels, holy and whole, broken, meeting the one, open, body and soul. God gathers us as a beachcomber gathers and marvels at every precious surviving piece of beach glass she finds. We are never alone. We are never lost to the one who seeks humanity's wholeness. We affirm our commitment to be the body of Christ that knows we cannot be personally healed until we see the interconnected community as part of the process of healing. Jesus has the power to revision the family of God in which false boundaries are overcome. In a year of devastating loss of livelihood, we consider the economic health that reimagines status quo. Vessels, holy and whole, broken, needing the Let us acknowledge our need to restore, repair, and renew our holy vessels, which include the communities of which we are a part. Let us pray. God of all, you created us for each other. You set in us a yearning for companionship and an empathy that binds us together, protecting each other and delighting in one another. Yet too often we have broken down our relationships instead of building them up. We have been set against one another with the lie of scarcity. We have built systems and economies that widen the gap of resources rather than safeguarding fair-minded practices. Growing numbers of your people are suffering hardship, food insecurity, joblessness, the magnitude of the loss is so great that we look away, even from the need in our own community. People opened their lives to Jesus. We are drawn to the healer, opening our hearts with honesty about our lives and finding assurance that offers peace. Help us, healer. Show us our empathy. Forgive our complacence. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Amen. Vessels, holy and whole, broken, me. This love and security is meant for all people. We are capable of sharing our light 
and not running out of enough. Christ's hospitality that broke through false boundaries points the way for you, for me, for all. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, since as members of one body we are called to peace. Imagine the peace of Christ extending beyond your walls to the neighborhood, the wider community, the church, and seeing it spread like the rising sun. Let it expand to all the world. Let this be our peace. Amen. Amen. Excited to share a special children's time today and throughout the season of Lent. I invite you to participate by pausing this video long enough for you to grab today's item, a blanket. By the way, it helps if the blanket is one that for any reason is special to you. Breathing is an act of healing. But before anything else, let's breathe. I'm not talking about inhaling and exhaling, but true breathing. When we inhale, we take in oxygen, which our bodies need. But when we breathe, something else ha happens. In the Bible, we hear these words from Job, chapter 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. When we breathe, each spirit is a spirit breath. It's the breath of God Almighty in our lungs. Our bodies need oxygen, and our souls, and our souls need the breath of God working to heal us from the inside out. I brought something fun and special with me today that helps me breathe, and I hope it will with you too. I call this a breathing ball. When we breathe in through our nose, I'll make it expand. When we breathe out through our mouth, I'll make it smaller. Breathe in with me through the nose and out through the mouth. And again, in through the nose and out through the mouth. Experiencing God's love in the world is an act of healing. Many faith communities, the place where they worship, 
is called the sanctuary. I love getting to be in our ch church's sanctuary. Did you know that the sanctuary doesn't mean the churchy with with pews and the altar where God plays the organ during the week when no one else is around? Sanctuary actually means safe place. There are lots of kinds of sanctuaries. A bird sanctuary is a place where birds are safe from hunting or habitat destruction. An elephant sanctuary is a safe place for elephants to live and not worry about poachers. A church sanctuary is any place where God's people can feel and name all the feelings life brings. Joy, sadness, fear, anger. Knowing they are safe in God's love and in community with one another. One of the big challenges during the past year is that in order to live up to the a sanctuary's true definition as a safe place, many churches have made the very hard decision to postpone in-person worship. After And other churches, while still meeting in person, have tried to keep their worship spaces as safe as possible by requiring attendees to wear masks, providing hand sanitizer stations throughout, and making sure that seating observes safe distancing, distancing guidelines. In either case, can you believe how much thought and work has gone into keeping God's people as safe as possible? And in either case, it just doesn't feel the same, does it? What we need is something to help us feel the sense of sanctuary at home. This is my blanket. It is special to me because my Nana made it for me and gave it to me a few hours after I was born. When the weather gets colder, I like to have it nearby. Sometimes when I've had a rough, rough day, I wrap it around my sol soldiers, shoulders. And other times, I just need to touch something soft and reassuring. Why don't you guys go get your blankets, and you can pause the video while you do. Let's all wrap our blankets around our shoulders. Imagine your whole church community giving you a big hug. Imagine your friends and family giving you a big hug. Imagine God giving you a big hug. During this difficult time, we haven't gotten to experiment as much as healthy touch as we need, but love is still there. As we keep these blankets around our shoulders, let's say a special blanket blessing so that every time we wrap our blankets around our shoulders, we can know that we are in a safe place to our ex express our truest selves and experience the he healing touch of God's love. Repeat after me. Praying is an act of healing. Loving God. Loving God. Please bless these blankets. Please bless these blankets. So that whenever we wear them. So whenever we wear them. We can feel the warmth of your love. So then we can feel the warmth of your love. We can feel the healing touch of your hands. We can feel the healing touch of your hands. We can feel safe to be our truest selves. We can feel safe to be our truest selves. Amen. Amen. We have another healing story from Matthew's Gospel, and this one with an interesting twist. The one seeking healing is a Roman army officer asking for help for his servant. The centurion understands authority because he has authority over his soldiers and his servant, but he also recognizes Jesus' authority by addressing him as Lord. Jesus is impressed with the Gentile centurion's degree of faith and trust, 
and the servant is healed. I'm reading Matthew's Gospel from the New Revised Standard Version. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, appealing to him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed in terrible distress. And he, Jesus, said to him, I will come and cure him. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard him, he was amazed and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and will eat with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown out into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go and let it be done according to your faith. And the servant was healed in that hour. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. We are here with uh, Liz Hall who is uh, the lead organizer for the Bay Area IAF, and she is going to be having a conversation with me for this week's Witness, and um, we're going to get right into it. So, Liz, thank you for being with us here today, uh, and uh, wanted to ask you, uh, who is the IAF, and uh, what do they do? Hmm. Uh, well, the IAF stands for Industrial Areas Foundation. And it is the name that we have had since 1940, uh, when uh, the first IAF organization was born in the back of the yards neighborhood of Chicago. Uh, people who were working in the meatpacking plants were living in just and working in deplorable conditions. And what Saul Alinsky, our founder, figured out was. Um, amidst all this energy of trying to figure out how to how to organize people, that people are already organized uh, in their workplaces, in their congregations, uh, in their neighborhoods. And so he brought, worked with the Catholic Archbishop and the CIO of the AFL-CIO and brought labor and the Catholic Church and uh, local neighborhood groups together to form the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council, an organization of organizations uh, where people could have enough power to be able to act to affect the conditions that were uh, determining the, their quality of life. Uh, and based on the success of that model um, over the last, what would it be now, 81 years, we over across the country, organizers and clergy and lay people and neighborhood groups have been having one long conversation about how to build local broad-based power organizations in local communities. Very cool. How did, uh, would you mind sharing a little bit of your story and how you ended up working with uh, the IAF? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Southern California in Long Beach. And uh, maybe the best way I could describe my experience or what got me into organizing is that on Sundays, I grew up at church and I learned at church about the world as it should be, where uh, love wins, where we take care of each other, where everybody has enough. Um, but on Saturday in neighborhoods across the city where my friends lived, um, family members that we would go visit in our extended family, I saw the world as it is. Um, and I remember one particular day, actually, I was reminded of this just a couple of weeks ago. I was seven or eight years old and 
on the Saturday morning, my dad put us in the car and we drove out to the Inland Empire in Southern California to my aunt's apartment that had just burned down. And all I remember from that day is that um, the apartment burned, I think it was faulty wiring. And it was me and my cousins packing up the kids' stuff, trying to figure out what we could keep and what was too burned needed to be thrown away. While my dad and his brothers and sisters figured out where my aunt was gonna stay that night so her kids could stay in the same schools. And the church wasn't there on Saturday. So when I got, I left home and I went to college, I wanted to know whose fault it was that all these things were happening in the world as it is. And somebody told me it was the system. And so I was against that. And I became a protest groupie. And if you name it, I tried it in terms of ways to make change in the world, almost everything. Um, I could have been, a, maybe I should have been a CEO. I didn't try that. But, uh, but in terms of the world of activism and social change, I tried a lot of things. And I ended up one day as a nonprofit executive director, sitting across the table from a Catholic nun who has been an organizer with our network for over, at that point, it was over 25 or 30 years. And 10 minutes into the conversation, I was hearing stories about how people of faith were acting in the world as it is to bring it closer to what it should be. And I thought, I want to know more about what you do. And that was my introduction to the IAF. Wow. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. That's a wonderful story. It's been so 10 years. For uh, this week, we are exploring the, uh, the, the theme of communal healing, and much of Christian tradition teaches that our individual well-being is directly tied to the well-being of those around us. Now, in organizing, one of the foundational lessons we're taught is about the nature of power and, and why we want it. The thing is, power, is oft power often carries negative connotations, so folks rarely talk about it in quote-unquote polite conversation. So, but, um, but Liz, why is power important? And specifically, why would it be important in, in seeking communal healing? Well, I think the thing that those of us in church have to wrestle with, because um, I think power is a bit, it has a bad connotation and it particularly has a bad connotation um, in faith communities. We wanna talk about love. I don't know if you'd say that's right or accurate, Keith. I don't. I I know that we rarely do talk about power, um, and we do talk a lot about love. Yes, and love is important. <laughs> love is very important. Love is foundational, um, but power is biblical. Um, in fact, you know, Second Timothy one seven says, but. God did not come to bring a spirit of cowardice or timidity, right? But a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Yeah. And uh, there's a Catholic theologian, Romano Guardini, that a lot of organizers in the IAF re have read and, and studied. And Pope Francis, I think, was writing his dissertation on Guardini when he was um, elevated to become the Pope. Uh, but he says, you know, we have to deal with power because power comes from God, that it's foundational, that that's what God gave to Adam. Um, and when he gave him the power, the ability to name the animals, that it is a gift from God for us to use in the world. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, it is the ability to act, to shape the world around us. And that not only are we called to have to put up with it and deal with it, but we're called to act with it, to build it, to embrace it. Um, and of course, then the question becomes, what are the ethics? How do we use it? Um, and that's really, I think, where um, the question of how could we use power to heal comes in. Mm -hmm. 
what kind of what kind of power do we do we think is uh, or do do we tend to uh, try to build when when we're organizing? Well, we think about there are um, two concepts of power, uh, and um, the concept of power that most of us are the most used to dealing with is what you might call unilateral power, the power that Pharaoh exercised over the Hebrew slaves, um, top down command and control. Um, I say you do. And um, that's the kind of power most of us experience growing up in school. It's the kind of power most of us experience in the workplace. And we are sort of arguing to retrieve a different kind of power. Now, unilateral power is appropriate sometimes, you know, maybe in a crisis. Certainly those of us that have children, if you're walking across the street, it is not optional. We're not going to have a, a long discussion about why you need to hold my hand. You're, we're crossing the street. You're going to hold my hand. I say you do. <laughs> um, but the problem with that is that we use it, if that's the only model we have, we use it inappropriately. And um, there is another model of power, which is relational power that we're trying in our IAF organizations to retrieve. That is not about top down, it's power with. It's the kind of power that the Hebrews, once they escaped Egypt, had to learn how to build with each other, which I, is my understanding that, you know, rabbis will say that that's why they had to spend 40 years in the desert to go, what was it, 150 miles. It doesn't take 40 years, even if you walk, even if you walk slowly, even if you walk in circles for a while, it doesn't take 40 years to go 150 miles. Uh, but it took 40 years for the Hebrew people to get Egypt, that kind of unilateral power out of their system and become a people who could negotiate and deal with each other and self-govern, who were invested and built power through relationships. And that's the kind of power we're trying to build in our, our institutions. Thank you for that. Yeah. Some would argue that it the 40 years may not have been enough uh, in the end when, you know, when we think about, you know, the, 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 you know, the trajectory of biblical history, but yeah, it, there, there is something to that. Um, we having to, we having to, the new generation having to learn uh, or relearn a new culture, a new culture of power. Yeah. That is, that is I don't know if you've uh, read this book, but there's a, um, there's a book called trauma and recovery that was written by Judith Herman. That's, that's I, my understanding is it's, it's a really kind of seminal work in the, in, in trauma kind of recovery um, in that world. And, you know, she says that there's in, in any kind of trauma or act of violence, right. There's a victim and a perpetrator and then there's the bystander mm. and that the bystander will almost always take the perpetrator's side huh. unless there is a political constituency, unless there is power, organized power, right? That causes the bystander to see the victim and take the victim side. Mm -hmm. And I think that's relational power. That's the, the kind of power that she's talking about has to be relational. We always take the perpetrator side because left to our own devices, we succumb to unilateral power. Yeah, that's, that's a book I'm going to have to add to the list. That's that is good fodder. I mean, we can go on about that, but um, man, a related topic to uh, to power and relational power uh, is um, the the existence uh, and the role of institutions. Uh, the word institution or even institutionalized kind of carries some negative connotations. Uh, the philosopher Hugh Hecklow talks about how modern people have developed a distrust 
in institutions and for good reason, he admits. But he also talks about how we as human beings will always need them. Uh, so what role do you believe institutions like congregations, unions, schools, libraries, what do you think they play in building a healthy community? Oh, well, you've, you've kind of called us on, um, one of the things we like to do is use words that nobody likes to say, right? So power institution, uh, but probably the most foundational institution that we have is the family. And, you know, one of the questions that we'll often ask is, why do families exist? You know, they exist not just to provide a roof over the head, although that's important, very important and very hard for some families to do right now, food on the table, right, survival, but also for, for the formation of a person who could become an adult who can participate in the world. And a family can't do that alone, mm -hmm. They probably could never do that alone. However you define who's in your family, you know, we can't do it by ourselves. Um, not only can we not form our children by ourselves, but increasingly we can't have an economy where we can put a roof over our head, um, where we can have enough food to eat, where we can have health care and mental health care when we need it, where we can live in a safe neighborhood by ourselves with just the three or the five or the 10 or the 20 people that you might consider to be in your family. And that is the role of institutions um, or the kind of institutions that we organize anyway, right? That you mentioned congregations, union locals, schools, nonprofit organizations, you know, every one of those kinds of institutions that we organize has as part of its mission to stand for and with families and to help them navigate the pressures. And our institutions are so critical because they are the first place that many families call when they're in a crisis. And if our institutions are not strong and healthy and vibrant and able to respond to that call, um, both in terms of meeting the immediate need, but then even beyond that, the question becomes, you know, if the immediate need is hunger, right? Mm -hmm. We want our institutions to be strong enough to provide some food. Mm -hmm. But then the question becomes, why are people hungry in this neighborhood? Why are people hungry in our city? What can we do about that? And that's where an organizing effort a broad-based organization is essential to be able to build the kind of power so we can address those bigger systemic issues that one congregation or one nonprofit can't do on their own. Um, I have a 16-month-old daughter and um, never has being a member of a church been more important to me than as a new parent. And honestly, not because I know that one day somebody else besides me is going to teach her the Lord's Prayer. I mean, I could care less about that right now. <laughs> but it's having a community of people that have my back. <laughs> so to me, that's the, that's, that is why our institutions matter. And uh, because people have their backs up against the wall. And if our institutions are not strong, where will we be? Mm -hmm. right. And we see that every day. People feeling isolated, disconnected, alone, on their own. And it's our job to make sure that they don't have to feel that way. Uh so thank you so much for your time, uh, Liz. There's there's one last question that I do want to close on. Sure. And it's um in from from if I remember correctly, you've been organizing for about ten years, right? Right. Yeah. Um, where does your confidence in the ability of common citizens to stand up against the interests of power corporations, governments, or whoever, wh where does your confidence come from? 
Hmm. Well, do you think I'm confident? You you sure look like confident? <laughs> I don't know if I would describe it as confidence, although I, I wouldn't want anyone listening to this to take that in the wrong way. Um, but I think what I find uh, hope in, so there are certainly days where I read the paper like everyone else or listen to too much news and I just want to like crawl in bed and pull the covers over my eyes and wait, you know, some magical amount of time until something is better. Um, but I think for me, um, then I get a phone call uh, from one of our leaders, like happened the other day, um, who was telling me that she had organized a group of people uh, because there were too many families that were coming to the clinic in Marin County saying that um, they can't afford their rent and they don't know what to do. And so she'd organized a group of people to get trained on how to, how to reach out and connect those folks with rental assistance. And did I want to come to that and talk about organizing? and how we won that money for rental assistance and how they could be part of doing that with the clinics. Um, and that's what gives me hope. I guess that's what gives me confidence is uh, as long as people are angry about what's happening in our own community to our neighbors, to people that we care about, which requires us to be in relationship with other people. <laughs> Um, and as long as somebody wants to do something about that, uh, so do I. Well, thank you very much. That's a great answer. Uh, again, this is our guest, Liz Hall with uh, Bay Area IAF. Thank you so much for your time, Liz. And if you're interested in learning more about, uh, uh, about the IAF, about uh, uh, the Marin Organizing Committee, uh, they have a website, which uh, we'll, put, we'll, put a, we'll put links in, uh, in the video description for, uh, for this video. And um, of course, I am always willing to uh, take questions as well. So um, thank you, Liz. And I'm hoping we'll have further conversations about uh, getting organized and, uh, and doing more for our communities and getting our communities organized. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
together in prayer. We pray to the God who can make something beautiful out of brokenness. We pray for restoration of the economic health of our community. Healer of our every ill, we are bored, we are anxious, we are eager to move on, we are fearful of moving on, we work too much, we do not work at all. Hear our prayer for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We pray especially for those who have experienced the loss of livelihoods and economic security and are feeling helpless to care for their families. Hear our prayer for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We pray for those whose businesses have failed or on the shaky ground between survival or closure. Hear our prayer for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We pray for those whose shortage of resources has been made even more critical during this pandemic. Hear our prayer for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We pray this day for courage and passion for a vision to see how we as a church, as a part of this community, can be of help now and into the future. We pray for peace in the name of your Christ Jesus, the very Prince of Peace who left us with this prayer. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Well, it's Michael here to have the last word about weekly worship video number 51. And to thank you for choosing to spend this time with us today as part of the virtual community that flows from the Napa Methodist Church. We're at the second Sunday in Lent and getting closer to Easter. Easter is the 4th of April this year, and it will be here before you know it. I hope you're following the Daily Lenten Devotions Guide written by, well, it's written by us. And it's a good way to keep up with our holy vessels, sea glass, beauty out of brokenness message theme. The Lenten Devotions Guide is available daily at NapaMethodist.org, and it's on our Facebook page. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that this is our second Lent and Easter to not be worshiping together in person. And next week's video number 52 is the one-year milestone. There's a poem by Robert Browning that suggests your reach should exceed your grasp because to achieve anything worthwhile, a person should attempt even those things that might be impossible. We set out a year ago with this video form of worship, not to do the easiest online style, but what we thought would give us the best result for a few weeks until everything returned to normal. We just wanted to keep the wheels on the old wagon for a while. And by golly, we wound up building a bigger wagon. We made something beautiful out of something broken. And do I get tired of quoting Michael's mantra each week? Not a bit because I believe it's a vital step in getting the coronavirus under control. So remember to wash your hands, keep your distance, be patient, and mask up in public. Get vaccinated. Do your part. Let me send you forth now with this blessing. Now go with confidence that our gracious God is gathering us all for safekeeping recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears, I will come. And may the Spirit hover, move, and deliver balm to your soul and a spring to your step. Healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. So go now in peace, and may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you?